Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start. Um, do we have any questions about any of the anatomy stuff to start with? The Vegas chart. chart, okay. Well, that seems to be everybody's favorite thing. Does it, do we want to go over that? All right, we can start with that. Um, let me get this thing going so it's... Point this out. All right, we'll just go through, we'll get to the point where we have the Booyers chart and then we'll, we'll go through it. But as we're going through this, if you see something, take note, we will come back to it. If you don't have something on your notes or you don't understand something, we can come back to it. We'll probably come back and talk a little bit about the conducting pathway because that can get a little confusing. And remember, we talked a little bit about um, the currents before we talked about the Booyers chart as well. Okay. So that's the sort of stuff. So we can come back and talk about that. But we'll do the Wiggers chart first. All right, so there we go. All right. So the Wiggers chart shows us pressure in the, well, which, which three things? Aorta, atrium, and ventricles, right? And the reason these are important is because we have valves between these structures. And so the Wiggers chart is going to look at pressures in those three areas, and that should tell us something about whether valves are open or closed. So I'm going to do the chart. We'll use, um, well, let's see, we'll start off with atrium in blue. We'll do the ventricle, excuse me, ventricle in red. And we will do the aorta in black. Right. Now, what I've drawn here would start here. This is time zero. Remember, it's something like 0.8 seconds. We're talking about 75 beats per minute. And that is certainly within sinus rhythm. Now, um, we're trying these three different pressures, and if we think about the way the valves are going to work, the valve between the atrium, or should I say atria, I said atrium, singular, okay, and the ventricle. Which way is blood supposed to flow here? Right, so as long as pressure is high here, and low here, would the valve be open or closed? High, low, which one is it open? Okay. As soon as it turns the other way, if this is high and this is low, what happens to the valve? Closes. Otherwise, things would go backwards, right? Blood would flow backwards. So we want that. If we talk about the other valve, we have the aortal semilunar. So we have the aorta. Here's the ventricle. And if we have high pressure here and low pressure here, is the valve open or closed? Open, right? Because that's the way we want things to move. So we go from the ventricle to the aorta. What happens if we have high pressure here and low pressure here? Closed, right? So flow cannot go backwards. Cannot go backwards because the valve is closed, right? So the key things, anytime you look at this chart, as long as you know uh, which one's high and lower, you should be able to tell me something about the valve being closed. Now, um, where do valves open or close on this chart? Yeah, where lines cross. So one thing you should be able to tell me, for example, at this point, is the mitral valve open or closed? Lines cross, what happens with mitral valve? Well, it's if if it it closes because if it were here, if it's here, then if it were open, blood would flow backwards. Like if the pressure is higher in the ventricle than the atrium. 
so it has to close. What about the semi later? Still closed, right? So, you know, things open and close when the valve, when things cross, but then a lot of times we're going to stay closed for a long time. So, when, for example, we think about the micro valve, it closes here. When does it actually open? I'll number these points to help us. One, two, three, four. When does it open again? Micro valve opens two. Yes, but when does the micro valve open again? Four, right? So it's closed during this entire time, right? It's open from here back to the front end of the next cardiac cycle, okay? So when you're doing these, you should be able to tell me any point if Valve open or closed, you may have to go backwards and forwards to look and see what the points are, but you should be able to do that. Now, um, we also talked a little bit about the idea of diastole and systole. So if I go through this and I look at this, is the ventricle in diastole or systole? Diastole, what about here? How do you know it's a systole? Pressure's rising, and so systole really means what, what is the muscle doing during systole? Contracting. Contracting, right? And so that's why the pressure's building. Um, here, the atria, I should say the atrium, is it in diastole or systole? Diastole. The only point it's in systole is this little bump here. Okay? And what type of uh, filling did we talk about occurs during that bump? Active filling, the rest of the time we have passive, passive filling, right? We both mean by passive filling is just blood's flowing from the atrium into the ventricle. So again, most of these things are in diastole most of the time. Even the ventricle is in diastole most of the time. Um, so let's take a look at this particular point here, too. And of course, we know what valve opens here. The malunar opens, okay? That means from here to here, valves are closed. From one to two, both valves are closed. And the same thing is true from three to four. There is a term that we use that applied to both those positions that, that uh, uh, describe this condition where both valves are closed, and we can measure a particular volume there. The volume does not change during this period because the valves are always closed, so blood can neither enter nor leave. What is that? Isovolumetric. Isovolumetric, right? So we talk about isovolumetric contraction and sensation, okay? Because what's going on here is pressure is building, even though the volume is not changing. Pressure is decreasing even though it's not changing. Okay? Um, so there we go. So we can walk through. We have essentially you know, pressure builds in the atrium, blood's flowing into the ventricle actively. The pressure builds up enough that the mitral valve closes. The ventricle is starting to contract, so we have this isovolumetric contraction. At two, the semilunar opens up because the pressure in the ventricle is finally greater than the pressure in the aorta. And then from two to four, or I should say two to three, we have what? Ventricular fibs. Injection fibs, or ventricular ejection, right? And so during that entire time, blood is leaving. Until we get to the point where the pressure is fallen enough that pressure is higher in the aorta than it is in the ventricle. And if the valve did not close, blood would flow backwards. So that's why we have semi litter flow. All right, um, let's see. else here. If I think about isovolumetric contraction and isovolumetric relaxation, during one of those points I can measure the EDV. Which of those points can I measure EDV? On the left or the right? Right. EDV. What is EDV? Okay, so that's what? Someone else. Volume of blood out the diastole. Okay, so is this the 
is this the way I can measure the volume flow after diastole here? Yeah, right? What would I, what could I measure here? ESV, right? The volume of blood after systole, after we've had all this contraction. I would measure EDV here, okay? And I can measure essentially everywhere along here because the volume's not changing, essentially, okay? Um, if I took the EDV and I subtracted out the ESV, what would I have? Stroke volume. Stroke volume, right. And that's part of, I use stroke volume and heart rate to calculate. Heart rate. Okay. okay. All right, so and again, if that equation appears on the test, you'll I'll, I'll, I'll write the equation down either on the test or the board. Okay, but you do understand the concepts of the relationship. All right, so we'll start adding some other things. The heart sounds S1 and S2 are associated with valves opening or closing? Closing, okay. So where, where are the valves closing? Which two points would we would have sounds? One and... One. This is S1. This is S2. All right. Um, let's go to talking about this guy. This is an EKG, and this is called what? P Q R S T. Okay. So, where approximately would I find P on this guy? If I go across, right? This would be P. Why? Because P is associated with what? Ventricles depolarizing. So I'm going to decide what happens when, when that, so what happens when the atrium depolarizes. What happens when any muscle depolarizes? Contracts, right? If you have contraction, the pressure builds up, and that's why we're seeing pressure build up here. That's that contraction. Um, where we would see QRS, right? Somewhere around here. This happens very quickly, so they're almost instantaneous. Um, what we're really seeing is all depolarization, but we're moving through a complex three-dimensional structure, so you get this, co this uh, complex wave. And the T is associated with what? Depolarization. Yeah, repolarization, which again, should be some sort of relaxation, so we should say we're somewhere around there, okay? Is there anything else on the Wigger's chart we've left off? I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it looks really daunting when we first started, but everything is kind of related to each other, right? Um, so it's one of those things that um, I think you, if, you, if you can go through a few times, I suggest to somebody, if you look online, I now have one that's, um, I should have posted earlier, but I forgot about it. There's one that's a fresh copy, and I'll print it out two or three times, and then just go through one aspect of it, and then maybe another sheet do another aspect of it, Right, and then by the end, you should be able to put them all together because they're all highly related. Is there anything I left off on the Wigger's chart that you guys have questions about? All right, so let's go back and talk a little bit about the conducting pathway because that's what underlies the PQR test, right? In order to get to this to happen, we have to have a conducting pathway. And so when we're talking about the conducting pathway, where does, well, if we talk about sinus rhythm, and when we talk about sinus rhythm, what conditions do we have to have? This is a proper electrical functioning heart, right? Electrically functioning heart. So what kind of things have to be true? The SA note has to be SA note has to be Dominant pacemaker. What about the speed of the heart, of the heart rate? Air breath. 60 to 100. Okay. 
If it's too fast or too slow, one possibility would be that the pacemaker cells themselves have problems. If it's greater than 100, what is it called? Echocardia. Less than 100 is called? Bradycardia. Which one of these is always going to be a problem? Right, bradycardia could just be the sign that someone has a very efficient heart. Um, so again, we talked about if they come in and they look like they just ran, you know, completed an Ironman and they have bradycardia at rest, that's probably not a problem. But you know, if your 80 year old aunt has bradycardia, that's probably going to be a different matter. Okay. Uh, what's the final thing? Yeah, this conduction pathway. So the SA note can't just be only setting the pace; it has to follow a particular pattern. Pattern of conduction. And traction. And we'll go over that proper pattern. All right. So, all right. So we'll start off. We have the SA node. Travel through a conducting pathway called internodal. And while we're doing that, little bits of activity travel into the atria. All right, so again, it's sort of like some dominoes, we set them off, and every once in a while you have a branch where the main line of dominoes gets going, but branches go off, right? And as we go off into, uh, into the atrial muscle, the atrial muscle begins to what? Depolarize and then contract, right? Um, think about this, which side, which atrium will contract first, the right or the left? Right, right, because the SA node is on the right side. So in order to go and activate stuff that's on the left, we have to travel apart, okay? So here's our internodal, where do we go next? node. I'm going to draw this a little bit bigger because one of the things that's true about the AV node is things slow down there. So a little bit of a, a pause because we're traveling to the AV node slowly. It's sort of like going on the highway and all of a sudden you come to a big city and you have to slowly drive across it. You get to the other side, you can start speeding up again. And the speed up occurs in what? This, which we also call the interventricular, it divides into a right and to a left, and then into these fibers, where the fibers called Purkinje fibers. Okay, and then at the end, the Purkinje fibers were in muscle. You guys saw all the Purkinje fibers in lab. What was unusual about them? Compared to the muscle. Well, maybe. What's unusual about the Purkinje fibers? They were not really striated. You didn't see the red actinomycin there. You didn't see the striations. So they're they're big and pale. Uh, what is their why is their size important? Yeah, they're just like kind of acting like a big axon, right? And bigger. Bigger things carry the action potential more quickly. Right? So you tell and command to have right. So um, that's they travel. Things travel really quickly through those Purkinje fibers. So you know, really, once we get to the AV node, both ventricles are going to be contracting almost simultaneously with each other. Again, the right is contracting slightly deeper to the left, right? but not not a huge difference. All right. So that's the conducting pathway. Now, when we're talking about this picture, if the SA node is destroyed, what happens to the pace? It goes down. It goes down. Slows down. And what would be the pacemaker in that case? The AV node. And if it's destroyed, the Kenji's set the pace very, very slowly, but you know, probably too slow to be effective for the heart. Okay. So this is the proper conducting pathway. Right. Anytime this would be disrupted, for example, if we had the SA node is not firing, the AV node is taking over. 
That's not a sinus rhythm. There are people that have, coming on the AV node, a, pump, a pathway that goes back into the atrium and actually causes the atrium to fire again. So the atrium is kind of having a double firing every time the heart beats. That's not a sinus rhythm because that's an extra pathway that should not exist and that ends up causing problems. And so there's quite a few things like that. But if we're following that particular pathway, it's happening between 1600 beats per minute. And the SA node is setting this whole pace. We have what we call sinus rhythm. All right. Um, let's talk about the two different types of action potentials I've observed in this system. And the two different types of action potentials would be observed in these guys. have pacemaker action potentials and currents and essentially all the muscle which I'm including over here which can track a lot like a cardiac I should say or a, a different action potential it's different than skeletal muscle Let's see. we'll talk and we'll talk about some differences it has this will look different okay so we'll put these two guys on the board, and then we'll kind of go through some of the electrophysiology. Because so I think everybody's kind of wigger, wigger charted out, and so they probably uh, might forget to study about this, right? Because this is still important, so. Don't wig out. All right, I'm gonna draw the, act, draw the action potential for the pacemaker first. Okay. It looks something like this. And try to draw these to scale, right? So this is something that, you know, would be the pacemaker. The ones for normal cardiac muscle look something like this. Now they're going to be a little bit set back because again, this signal has to reach this cell. So here's what they look like. So those are you know, two different types of things. So which one is the pacemaker? The one's on top in blue. I think I said that, so I can't really. All right, so if I look at this, um, I'm going to draw a little line here. You tell me what we would call that line, two of them. So this is an example of what? Special. Special, OK. And this is an example of? another threshold okay so this is unusual it has two distinct thresholds one in which the cell is becoming positive enough and one in which the cell is becoming negative enough to allow something to happen right when that's very unusual that's what gives this uh, cell pacemaker property so if I think about the currents that are involved, remember uh, we use a letter to indicate currents. What's that letter? Uh, I. Okay, and that's from studying electricity. I is current. Okay. So we typically name currents after just um, what kind of ions are flowing. So this particular thing is what kind of current? Uh, yeah, that's right, right. So this is a, it is calcium current, okay? And so if we think about what happens in the cell and the channel opens up, and that's what happens, the threshold channel, the voltage gauge channel opens up, calcium is high inside or outside the cell? Outside, outside so calcium flows in, making the cell more positive, okay? What happens when we get to the top and we're starting to come back down, what kind of current is this? Potassium currents, right? And so again, we think about potassium. Potassium is high inside or outside the cell? Inside. inside, so it will flow out. And as it flows out, positive charges leave. The cell becomes more negative. Now, eventually, it's going to become negative enough 
that we're going to reach the second threshold. And remember, a threshold is when channels open. And what sort of current, what current flows through this channel? I IF current, okay? And that's the funny current because, again, it's actually starting when the cell becomes a negative. What ion is flowing, making up that funny current? Sodium. Sodium, okay? So sodium enters the cell, making it more positive. If I look at these two currents, right, or this current, this current, this current, what's the size of this current relative to these other two? It's longer. What about size? Smaller, right? And that's why the cells become positive slowly, is that we're just letting a little bit of sodium in slowly. But that slow entry of sodium will eventually allow the cell to become positive enough that we reach the threshold that triggers the calcium current, and then the entire thing can repeat. So this is why we have this pace, because of these three currents. It's for the chicken and the egg, right? This guy is eventually reached because we reach this guy, and this guy is reached because we reach this guy, right? They're mutually allowing the other one to be uh, met at a certain rate. Let's say this guy is beating at 100 beats per minute, which is its normal rate. This, this is the SA node. How do I get it to slow down? How do I get it to speed up? What do I do to get it to slow down? Acetylcholine, right? What do I get to speed up? Norepinephrine. And that's the normal thing we do to speed it up. What's the other thing we could do? Epinephrine. Just so we remember a little bit about uh, what systems we're talking about, this is released from which division of the autonomic nervous system? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. And so we call that release that's slowing down the heart all the time what? Vagal Yeah. Because it's related to the vagal nerve. And so this guy is released through? Huh? Uh, sympathetic. Sympathetic, right? And so if it's a normal sympathetic interface, uh, Activation, we release norepinephrine. We have a massive sympathetic uh, activation, I should say, we would release epinephrine as well. So travel up from the adrenal glands and then go to the heart. What else does epinephrine do besides increase heart rate? Yeah. Tractility. And you guys, some, I not all the labs had this happen, but we had one lab where when we added epinephrine to the uh, Part of a frog, you could actually see that it was beating much more, more forcefully because it was squirting so hard, it's like moving the other hearts. Um, so, tractility would go up. All right, so that, and this, we'll, we'll come back to this concept in just a second. So, again, eventually this action potential that starts in the SA node will travel all the way through the conducting pathway and it will then arrive at a muscle, boom, 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 as it goes, right? And those cells are going to depolarize. And so the first thing they're going to do is they're going to cause this cell to reach threshold and what current will flow? Uh, it's a good guess, but it's not quite calcium. We're talking about reaching this threshold. Uh, not IF. It's only pacemakers. A simple sodium current. So this is a lot like an action potential. It's like what we talked about with uh, pretty much very similar skeletal muscle. And it's going to turn on, causing the cell to become positive. Around the same time, another channel is going to open up that's going to give us this flat broad. That's a calcium. All right, so this is an ICA current. And again, this is voltage gated, so it was opened up by threshold. What's unusual about this is it's extremely long-lasting.
So sometimes this is called an L-type current or long. And again, to give you an idea that we're talking about, it's about four times as long as a normal uh, uh, depolarization event you have in the skeletal muscle. Right? And that's a lo uh, the longest skeletal muscle. Right? It's about 200 milliseconds, so it's very, very long. And we have a name for this voltage-gated channel. Does everybody remember what this is? Something we also saw with skeletal muscle. Yep, this is DHP. Slightly different version. We'll come back to that in a second. So that's a DHP receptor. It's a cardiac version. And again, eventually the cell will repolarize. And so when we want charge to leave the cell, what do we usually do? What kind of channel do we open up? Potassium. So this is a potassium current. It goes back. And again, if there was no depolarization event, or if there was no pacemaker, the cell would just flatline. It would never go back again. But again, every once in a while, a wave of positivity is arriving through that network, and it will reach threshold, and we repeat this. So it's driven by the pacemakers. So let's take a look at what's going on with active myosin. for understanding what's going on in cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle is understanding that the DHP receptor and the reanidine receptor that we talked about last semester are still here, but they're no longer physically connected to each other. And so that means that whole mechanism of one blocking the other is out. And so we have to have a different mechanism for things to happen. And so this is what occurs. So first, we already know that the DHP receptor is being activated by voltage. So I'm going to draw this open state. And again, it's activated because the cell has become positive, right, because of the sodium coming in. And when it becomes positive, calcium will enter the cell. It's acting as a true channel. Now, we talked about last semester that Calcium is necessary for muscle contraction, and if you're just for a brief review, but you won't have to know this for the test, but you know, essentially what will happen is uh, troponin will uh, bind calcium, tropomyosin will move, actinomyosin start interacting, and they'll keep doing that as long as there's ATP and the calcium levels are high. Okay, so essentially the same thing we talked about last time. But it turns out this calcium that I've drawn here is really not enough to cause all the muscle contraction we see in cardiac muscle. It really only accounts for about 20% of the force that we know is generated. In other words, if I take a cell, a cardiac muscle cell, and I pull out all the calcium and I add just this amount here, it's only going to have 20% of the contractility I would normally observe. Right, so it means there has to be another source of calcium. And so if we're talking about a cell, what is the big source of calcium for a muscle cell? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. It is, it is chock full of calcium. And again, here we have our old friend, the reanity receptor. And instead of the reanidine receptor being mechanically activated whenever the DHP receptor is activated, it's going to be activated by the calcium that's coming in to the DHP receptor. So some of this calcium will go over, interact with the DHP receptor, and now we have a whole buttload, it's a technical term, of calcium coming out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so this is called calcium mediated calcium release. Mediated meaning enabling for this, this to happen or acting as the go-between, right? So calcium is going, acting as a go-between from the outside, interacting with the reanity receptor, allowing even more calcium to come out. 
So if we think about the stuff that's going on here, there's a lot of cellular things that can control this, right? I can make the DNP receptor stay open longer. I can make this guy stay open longer, right? A lot of different drugs affect these processes and we're leaving things off, obviously. And so I could increase the amount of calcium that's in the cell or I could decrease the amount of calcium in the cell. If I increase the amount of calcium that's out here, you know, activating troponin, right? Uh, is that going to cause a greater contractility or lesser contractility? Greater. Greater, right? And what do we call any sort of drug that does that? Positive ionotropic agent. Right? So it could be, and it's just a general thing to describe drugs. So there's a lot of these drugs we don't necessarily know how they work. We just know they are increasing calcium levels. If we decrease calcium levels, we decrease contractility. Right? That's a negative ionotropic agent. Right, and the heart would beat with less force. The natural anthropic reagent that we looked at in lab was epinephrine. Right? Okay, so that's how muscle contraction happens. There's one more thing that you that we well, there's probably more than one thing. But there's one thing that probably kind of slips people's mind a little bit. That is the uh, Frank Starling law. What's the word after? Actinomycin, oh, tropomycin moves. Actinomycin then moves. Frank Starling law. What did Frank and Starling discover? What's the what's brief way you can explain this law? The heart contracts stronger with more blood that goes into it. Yeah, so, so anytime the heart stretched, and if we think about the way the heart's usually stretched is because you fill it with more blood, right? But you can even do this from the outside. Like you can take a, uh, you can take a little string and tie it to the heart and put it, start stretching it, put a mechanical stretch on it, and it will start contracting with more force. So, again, we don't actually know why this works, but we just know it does, right? So if we have everything else being equal, the contractility does not change. If all of a sudden we start stretching the heart, the heart will start contracting with more force. And so if it contracts with more force, for example, the in systolic volume would start going down because we've got rid of more of the blood, right? Now, you know, we used to say that if you had 50 mils of blood left over at the end of systole, you might have 30 mils of blood left over in systole. So if that happens, what happens to your stroke volume? It goes up because, you know, you've, you've got rid of more. So you gotta think of the relationship. So when you do this on the test, you might wanna think about, okay, all right, so, um, so then we talked a little bit about the efficiency of the heart, and we talked about there's different things you could do. For example, you could, um, so it turns out when we talk about the respiratory pump, if I start doing jumping jacks, I force more blood back to my heart, okay? And that's gonna stretch out the heart, so the heart would actually contract harder, and stroke volume would go up. What do we call that factor where I'm actually putting more blood back into the heart? It is being return, but there is a technical term we use when we talk about the efficiency of the heart. Concept term. Preload. We preloaded the blood with more heart. Uh, with more, we preloaded the heart with more blood, right? Uh, if I lost a lot of blood, right, what's going to happen to my preload? It decreased, right? And again, that's why when you see the, a movie where somebody's heart rate starts spiking, well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to decrease the cardiac output by having the heart beat, and sometimes it's an indication there's internal bleeding, blood's not going back to the heart. So you may not see it from the outside, but if blood's in your abdominal cavity, not going back to the heart, you have to do something. All right, um, the other thing that we talk about is what happens if the heart has to work against a higher pressure? So if I have a high pressure in the aorta and out into the entire system, what happens to the amount of blood that's ejected there? It's gonna go down. Because, again, if we think about what happens if the aortal pressure is higher, that semilunar valve is going to close more quickly because it's going to be uh, easier for the aortal pressure to be higher than the ventricular pressure. And so we call that concept that the valves are going to close more quickly, the blood's going to expel less heart, uh, less blood um, under those conditions. What is, what's the concept term for that? So again, those are things we talked about the efficiency. 
How about the idea of, so let's see, do you guys understand the idea of cardiac output rest, cardiac output max, and cardiac reserve? Cardiac output reserve. What is cardiac output again? How much blood is pumped each minute? minute okay. So it's a basic measure of how much work the heart's doing. And so how would I find cardiac output? Well, that's going to tell me one part of it. Which part does that tell me about? Stroke volume. That's going to get me my um, mills. How do I find out? How do I get the time value here? Temporary. I can take heart. Okay. So heart rate times stroke volume is going to give me my cardiac output. Give me a way you'd measure the cardiac output at rest. How would I measure my cardiac output at rest? I was just curious. Well, well we might be a little hard. What conditions would we be talking about? Yeah, when you wake up, you could kind of, it'd be a little hard to find your stroke volume, but you could find your heart rate, and you would find out your cardiac output at rest. And what that would indicate would be the minimum amount of blood flow that you needed to just maintain your life, your body. So, CO at rest is minimum flow. Right? Uh, my cardiac output max would be the most flow I could have. So, if I figured out my highest heart rate, I could have and I figured out my highest stroke volume, I could figure out my cardiac output at max. Um, and so we talked a little bit about that stroke volume is also influenced by heart rate as well, right? Or I should say the preload is influenced by heart by heart rate. Let's go over that just real quick. We'll come back to this. <clears throat> so as heart rate goes up and is very high, what happens to preload? Simply not enough time for the stuff to fill up. So if heart rate goes down, preload goes up. Right? There's more time for blood to come out. So, you know, these things are a little bit related, but we could find some point at which I could generate the most blood flow through my body. Okay. Well, between those two. So that's the amount of stuff I can use to do work. Now, we talked a little bit about, you know, your cardio output max would go up, your, you could train yourself so your heart rate could go a little higher, your stroke volume is typically what would get more efficient. Cardio put output at rest, you know, let's say you're uh, running a triathlon and then you get in a wreck and you lose an arm, what happens to your cardio output at rest? It go down because you don't have to take, take any blood to the arm, right? So now, if you have more reserve, I want to suggest people do that as a way to increase their time, because the swim meets are getting a little harder. But uh, you get the idea, right? Uh, that really, if you can generate all this flow, and that means all this oxygen delivery, um, and you don't need as much, you know, and you're, and you're efficient when you're at rest, well, then you can use all that to do something. Okay. okay. Let's see. Let's go back to the slide and see if we missed anything. And again, well, let me get this slide down so you guys can see this a little bit easier. So 
so far. All this obligatory points. What do we use these for? Yeah, hard sounds in more than just, you know, S1 and S2, because you can hear those basically anywhere, right? But here specifically, we have sound points where we could hear particular vowels, right? Um, and then, you guys go to that. Murmurs. Uh, what uh, happens when we have a regurgitated vowel? What was that? Backwards fuck. So a murmur is any abnormal heart sound. Right, and we talk about two different ones here. The, the regurgitative one, which is also called an incompetent valve, blood's going backward. What about a stenosis? Yeah. It's narrowing, so it means that, for example, if we have a stenosis in the mitral valve, when the atria contracts and active filling and pushes stuff through, you can hear a scraping sound uh, because blood's trying to go through this narrow passageway. We've got that. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the interval stuff. That's not really, we didn't go into that too much. I probably should have taken that out. But You guys are pretty comfortable with the two different circulations. Hopefully, okay. Um, that. Pretty good. I think you should know this, right? Why is the infant's heart rate so high? Small heart, smaller hearts are inefficient. Partially because of that strength, uh, the uh, Frank Starling law, but a few other things as well, okay? Because as they get bigger, if you double in length, right, you uh, triple in volume. So as the heart gets doubles in length, it actually, it's the volume of blood that's in there is actually three times as much, okay? Uh, we talked about tachycardia and bradycardia, that that, this Frank Starling, talk about contractility, there's our afterload, and again, you can see that in the bottom condition here, this valve is not going to remain as open as long, because we're still generating the same amount of pressure, but pretty soon this guy is going to equal this pressure, and it would close. It's going to be easier to equal the pressure in the aorta in that second condition, close things down. All right, so, you know, I think you guys seem fairly prepared. You guys seem like you know the Wiggers chart pretty well. But again, I do, we, the Wiggers chart will be a big por portion of it. And I don't know if, how many points, so maybe like something like a third or something. But there's also some other stuff there. Well, we spent probably a third of the time on it. So I typically, when I write the test, I think about how much time we spent on stuff. And then the test should reflect that. So if you get stuck somewhere, or if you have questions, we still have till Wednesday. So email me, or we can have make appointments, or you can come by and see me.